we go. Oh, we are live. Hey. So is it about time to, or do it's we? A, it's about time. Um, if you want to talk for a little bit, it'll give people a chance to like. To get in, in and, and stuff. I'm, I'm assuming nobody's in there yet. So do 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 do. We're waiting, uh, waiting for people. One viewer. Just one Yay, viewer. Welcome. We've got a viewer. Super cool. <laughs> We're just waiting for folks to show up for the Bones program at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. We'll, uh, we'll get to it in just a couple of minutes. So. For those folks over here, can they tell us? Can you please tell us what the sound is like? Can you hear them? Can you, uh, can you guys hear me very well? Can. Yo tampoco. <laughs> 17 viewers. Hi, are we seven. Here? Hello. So we got 17 viewers. I think we'll go ahead and get started then right now and then uh, we'll go ahead and move on onto our program. So uh, my name is Kat. I work with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me pretty well. Um, we're out here at Penitencia Creek Park and I also wanted to introduce my uh, partner in crime uh, docent with, with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. This is Rick Mandel. Man Rick, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? Okay, um, well uh as Kat mentioned, I'm Rick Mandel and I've been a docent for Open Space Authority for <clears throat> about 10 years. And as a California naturalist, I've enjoyed wandering our parks, not only for the sheer beauty, but for the uh, CS-like puzzles hidden in the landscape. Uh, the puzzles would involve the five W's, who, what, where, why, and when, and today we are focusing on bones. Yes, we are going to talk about bones today. Um, we're going to try to uh, uh, throw some puzzles at you guys um, and get you uh, oriented to bones. Uh, this is not by any means going to be like a super thorough presentation because that requires so many years of coursework as I've already experienced. Um, but I did want to mention we are here at Penitencia Creek Park and um, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority actually helped fund Reach One of Penitencia Creek Trail, which is just off that way. So if you're ever interested in uh, checking out a great place to go running, biking, walking, exploring, this is a great place to come. And also a great place to potentially look for bones. So if you're, you know, if you're in further interested, maybe come out to one of your local parks and see what you can find. Um, so without further ado, I think we should go ahead and start looking for some bones. That's Excellent. a capital idea. That's a very, very good idea. Why don't we go ahead and go for a quick walk? This is a little awkward because <laughs> we're trying to uh, have noise and stuff, <laughs> but I don't want to like drop the mic. Mic drop. Haha. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Looking for some bones. You think we'll find some bones up here? Out here? Where do you think we'll find some? Hmm. 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 Whoa! Uh -oh. By Jove! We found some bones! Whoa. Okay. Rick, how do we even get started? There's just so many. So many. Uh, why did they get here? Maybe a predator? Maybe it's a prey. Or maybe something got the predator. So there's no flesh on the bones. No, that's true. I wonder how... What what got rid of the flesh? Has it been here for a long time? Oh, it, uh, it does. It looks like it's been here for a long time. Okay. So why don't we go ahead 
and see what we can find with this pile of bones. I'm actually gonna clip this mic to myself, I think. So then I have my hands free. And I'm gonna kneel and let's think about, well, what's the first thing that you would do, Rick, um, when you come across a pile of bones like this? Well, I would probably uh, take a picture as, it, as the bones lie <clears throat> so as not to preserve the evidence so we could go back later and, and ask more questions after we uh, pick up and categorize the bones. That is a great idea. That's called preserving context. So context is really important whenever you're looking at anything in the wild and in the wild. So it's a great idea to go ahead and take a picture before you do it. So cha-ching, we got some pictures right up there. So we're, I'm, I feel pretty set. But the next thing that I think that we should do with this is we should probably try sorting out the different types. Now, does anybody know, say, what this is? Up. Do you guys know it's okay to type it in the chat? Yep, you can totally type that in the chat. What do you think that is? It looks like something that would go on my back. And there's another one too. There's a pair. So I'm going to throw it out there because that's what I do. Said, is it a leg? Oh, well, guess. that would be a, a really strange leg. Ron says, is it a scapula? That is correct. That is a scapula. There are a pair of scapulas here and you can actually side them too. So scapulas sit basically down from your back and well, actually they're more like they're more like, I gotta flip them around. This is so weird. Um, they actually sit out and then your humerus sticks in this, in this uh, epiphysis or this a connection. A humerus is your top arm bone. So that's what a scapula is. We got two scapula here. And I'm gonna go ahead, for the sake of everyone's interest, I'm gonna go ahead and pick out and see if I can't sort the rest of these bones. So there's the scapula. What do you think this is, Rick? Oh. Well, let's see. This looks like a leg bone. Yeah. Of some sort. So that is a long bone. You actually have. Except for it's having a fit. Yep. I believe that's a red shouldered hawk. But so, yeah, there are actually several long bones um, that all mammals have. There are tibia, fibula, femur, humerus, radius, and ulna. Those are the main ones. And deer also have another specialized bone, which we also have, but it's actually a part of our foot. And this is called a metatarsal. So we're gonna go ahead and sort out those different long bones in order to help figure out what's what. So this is a humerus. You can't quite tell because it's missing its epiphyses. Epiphyl so what? Epiphyses. So young animals, including humans, um, our bones do not fuse completely until we're older. Um, and at different ages, different bones fuse. And it's different for different animals too. So this tells me, like I'm looking at a lot of these bones. And Rick, do you see any epiphyses on these bones? I do not. So that's telling me that this, this is probably a young individual. Um, can't say for sure because again, you know, it's different for different animals, but um, missing epiphyses kind of give you a good indication that um, 
the epiphyses fell off um, after the animal died and it didn't completely fuse onto the ends of the bones. So it's interesting. I think that this is a femur. I think this is, what did we say, a humerus? We have a metatarsal. We have a tibia. We have, whoa, there's some other cool things in here. What do you think this is? Uh, a bone that's similar to this one. Yep. So sometimes we also like to match them. So this is another femur. They're actually the same bone. So I'll put that in one pile. Do. Whoa, guys. What's that? That's another odd one. It's not a long bone. What do you think that is? Yep. That is a good guess. Good job, Carol. Yeah. So this is a part, I believe this is what, the ischial crust? Mm. Yeah. So there are actually three parts to a pelvis, uh, the sacrum, the, um, the ischium, and the, and the crest, which if you've ever seen a skeleton of a human, the crest is basically the hip bones, the, and the ischium is what you actually sit on, and then, um, and, and then you also have, oh, I messed that up. It's actually not sacral, sacrum, it's the pubic bones. Sacrum is actually a part of the lower back. But um, I know that's a part of a pelvis. And I think there's another piece of the pelvis here too. Hmm. What are these? Oh, these are light bones. Uh, well, uh, if it's from the same animal, which is uh, likely, I would say that this is, well, maybe the audience would like to know. Would we like to guess? Would like to take a, a guess. Mm, what do you guys think? It kind of reminds me of something I ate before. Mmm. Yeah, it does. I'm getting a little hungry thinking about it. Ribs! Yep. I'm guessing ribs. Yep. So we actually have a bunch of ribs in here. Here's some ribs. Here's some more ribs. And if anyone wants to check this out, this is pretty cool. Um, this is an ulna. And it actually, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. So there's radius and ulna uh, fit together really well. Um, because they, this is this part of your arm. And your radius actually rotates around your ulna like this. So that's how you can get that rotation. Now in some animals, you don't have that rotation. Um, that's what actually gives me a good guess as to what this might be. This I think might be a deer. So there are several indications that say that. Um, one, I'm looking at these and if this had an epiphysis it would fit really well. And these, actually, these bones actually fuse um, in a deer. Um, and that's actually doesn't allow rotation this way. So if anybody knows a deer, they know that they run really well. They are able to bound over fences and run straight away when they see you. Um, and that part of that is because they fuse their bones together in certain ways. Another example of that is something that we've mentioned before, which is the metatarsal. Um, we should demonstrate this. So a metatarsal is actually your foot bone. It's like the long part of your foot. I'm not sure if I can demonstrate that super well. 
but it's literally that part. And our metatarsals are only like this long. They're not very long at all. For a deer, actually, this bone forms the lower part of their leg. And they actually run on their toes. They don't run on their feet the way we do. There's a term for that. What is the term for running on your feet, on your tarsals? Uh, could it be related to the type of animal, like begins with a U? Yep. So for animals that run on their toes, they're called ungulates, and the type of locomotion they do, it's ungulograde. Can you say that 10 times fast? <laughs> and then for animals that actually run on their tarsals, you know, they form this pad, they're called plantigrade. And we're plantigrade, and so are a few predators as well. They're also uh, slightly plantigrade. So this is very cool. These are actually two metatarsals fused together, and it's called a cannon bone. Very nice. You can actually tell where they fuse together, and that's what happens uh, for most ungulates. Keep an eye on these terms. They will come and get you. They will. <laughs> they will. So, hmm. What other questions do we often ask when we're looking at a skeleton like this? We've kind of sorted them. Whoop. Hopefully I'm not pulling in this too much. Ooh, we also have some thoracic vertebrae. <sighs> Cervical vertebrae. So what do you think, Rick? What other questions do we often ask? Well, one question is, uh, where is the head? Or in, the, in case of bones, the skull. Yeah. So that is, a, that is an interesting one. We don't have a skull with this skeleton, it doesn't look like. Um, skulls are usually the most common thing that you will see, um, you know, in animal remains, but oftentimes they'll be missing. So I think we should take a look at some skulls. Um, one thing... Is skull like casing or something? Like why is it not here? I have no idea. I think maybe a scavenger may have picked it up and taken it off somewhere. Sometimes when you have a skeleton, you don't have the whole picture. And that's why you're asking all these different questions. So I, to wrap this up, I think that this is... This was a small, young deer. Um, you can tell it must have been pretty young considering the size of the scapula. I know that it's a deer also because of the angularity in this bone. Uh, most ungulates have pretty angular looking scapula. They also, um, like I said, we have those metatarsals and a cannon bone which is a pretty strong indicator that it's definitely an ungulate of some kind. Super cool. Why don't we go ahead and take a look at some skulls, guys? We'll go ahead and leave this one here, pick it up in a little bit. Hmm. So a few things that we also kind of wanted to mention to you guys um, when you're looking at bones and identifying bones, um, there are good reference guides to keep. Um, this is my, my old textbook from college. I like it, but it is pretty technical. It's got some really pretty pictures though, so if you like to have something that references, it is a good book to use. We do have a question. Uh-huh. So Lena would like to know, have there ever been circumstances that a whole skeleton has been found? Um, usually when they're really fresh, when they're really fresh, and I don't necessarily recommend like picking through bones that are really fresh, they're really stinky, they're, they're you know, they're usually pretty f fetid smelling. Um, in fact, 
<laughs> even some of our older skeletons when they aren't like cleaned properly they can have that kind of remnant uh, stinky smell to them I don't recommend it um, but usually when the fresher the kill the more bones you're gonna have attached to it um, in archaeological contexts which is really cool um, you won't necessarily have the whole skeleton because people actually take the pieces with the most meat and they'll leave the rest of it because they don't want to carry the whole carcass it's also actually called the schlep effect you know so as you're schlepping a carcass you're actually going to schlep the the pri you know the the meatiest most uh, calorically valuable pieces of the carcass and leave the rest of it behind so in arche archaeological sites you can see bones that have been left behind that weren't super like valued like the skull for instance or ribs or you know things like that and then in the actual home in the village site you'll find a lot more long bones um, that have been cracked open for marrow and things like that so that's a great question yeah. oh, also there's the paleontology <coughs> aspect mm -hmm. where Sometimes you can find complete skeletons at, say, a place like La Brea Tar Pits. That is a good, good one. Yeah, because animals get trapped. Or in a uh, in a big storm and they get they get caught in a mud flow. Mm hmm So yeah, that that is a good point to make. Is sometimes uh, you have these, what are they called? Like. Um, <clears throat> unexpected phenomenon you know just pure happenstance something happens and this animal dies and it gets preserved really really quickly and I am no paleontologist an archaeologist but that you know that is really important for also for for scientific discovery super cool but I did want to mention the references I do recommend having a reference with you whenever you're out bone hunting because you know um, it helps you identify once you figure out your skeleton and your layout it helps you figure out who it belongs to so that's important uh, Rick wanted to show this one this is another really good reference yeah called so this is a relatively recent reference by Mark Elbrock 2006 animal skulls so it's, it's pretty <clears> good yeah we have a question about, can you ever determine how long it's been since a skeleton was formed? Um, so it's dependent, um, dependent on how old. So in paleontolo pale paleontology context, um, you can use radiocarbon dating. You can use um, other isotopic dating in order to figure that out. Um, in archaeological context, we usually use radiocarbon um, to date uh, specimens that you know are are older than I want to say 300, 400 years old. Um, anything younger than that, it gets really dicey. It gets really dicey because you just have so many um, influences within the atmosphere and that kind of thing. So you're there's a long explanation for it, but generally that's. That's how you ide identify how long they've been. And uh, I think for forensics, like for recent things, they also use like beetles, like different, um, different types of insects and how they, they you know, uh, eat up the skeleton and they eat up the, the flesh. So depending on the remnants of the different types of um, insects, you can also identify like how long it's been since something died. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally CSI stuff. Uh, that's not really my specialty. I can tend to be in the middle focus of archaeology, but that's basically it. What about this stuff? So we got some skulls here. We got some other cool things here. Wanted to um, kind of go over. I think both of us kind of wanted to go over like some of the basics of skull morphology. So then, when you have a skull, you can actually identify whether it's been an herbivore, a rodent. Um, a predator or, or, or carnivore and um, or a bird okay so we're gonna start off I think I'm gonna use this as an example 
What is this? Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> well, we can look at the characteristics of it. Um, <clears throat> we look at the maybe the canine teeth. That yeah. is a very, very strong indication. Mm -hmm. So what does that say about the animal? Canine, strong, long canine teeth like that. Well, it's probably a, a carnivore or an omnivore. Mm-hmm. Is this one real? This is a bone clone. That means it's not. Yeah, this is a bone clone. It's okay, you, you don't have to be sad about this. Thing. It's, a, it's okay. Uh, sometimes it's good to not necessarily find a, an actual specimen out in the wild. They're guessing bobcat. That is correct. Yay. So we'll go through why this is a bobcat. This is, you mentioned, the, the canines are really important. The teeth themselves are really important. So wanted to mention, there's also these back teeth here. We have three types of teeth. We have incisors, we have canines, and we have molars. And um, carnivores, have very specialized back molars and are called carnassials. Carnassials. Now, as you can tell with this skull, um, the carnassials actually have a bit of a scissoring action. When um, you get something, you know, in between, you know, like a piece of meat or something, they actually act as scissors and they slice that meat open and they, they rip and tear and they swallow. They don't necessarily chew their food all that much. Um, the other thing too is these carnassials, they rub up against each other, so they're constantly sharpening, constantly sharpening their teeth. That tells you that this animal eats meat. It doesn't do things like trying to grind up plant material. Well, how about bones? And, and for crushing bones. This is a really good method for, for crushing them. Um, some animals are a little bit more interested in bones. Cats don't necessarily chew bones that much. It's, it makes it a little difficult for them. But like uh, coyotes and dogs. Yeah. Um, wolves and wolverines, mm -hmm. even sea lions. They, are, they have uh, grinding molars where they can crush the bones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of dogs have like their very, very back molars are good for crushing. Um, so that actually makes some of these animals on a continuum between uh, herbivore, omnivore, mm -hmm. and carnivore. So wanted to mention that. Also, what do you notice about the eyes, Rick? Uh, they're pretty far apart and facing forward. That is true. So there's another animal we know of that has forward facing eyes. You and me, <laughs> me and you. Um, humans also have what is called binocular vision and that allows for depth percep perception. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually test this out yourself at home. You can cover up an eye and then have a friend like throw a piece of paper at you, like a crumbled up piece of paper and see if you can catch it. It, it, get, it gets way more difficult when you are covering up one of your eyes. Um, so binocular vision is very important for predators to see how far away prey are. Um, you also notice that the eye orbits are very large, which means that this animal, this bobcat, relies on its eyesight a lot in order to in order to hunt prey. It's a uh, very reliant on that sense. Um, wanted to also take a look at this snout. What do you notice about that snout? Well, the snout, meaning the nasal cavity, mm -hmm. is pretty small. That is that is an apt description. So this is different. I want to compare it to our fox skull for a minute. Now, this fox is a little broken, and this is a real fox skull, but 
uh, foxes and most of your dogs are going to have a longer snout. And that means that they're more reliant on a sense of smell. So, um, you know, if you look at a skull and you're, you're trying to figure out what animal it is, it may be, you know, if it has a longer snout and it has uh, more carnivore-like teeth that you're looking at like a dog or a fox or one of those types of animals, even a badger, a raccoon, um, those kinds of animals, because they, they tend to use their sense of smell. Um, cats don't really, like they have a pretty good sense of smell compared to us. I mean, we don't have a snout. We don't even have a snout. So where, where our sense of smell is like terrible, but um, they have a relatively short, short snout. Um, Lena's asking if by chance we have a guinea pig skull. We don't actually have one of those today, but that's a fascinating thing. That would be a fascinating thing to look at. Yeah, uh, we do. Well, I didn't pull it out, but we have a pig skull and that has a long snout, too. So, you know, you can t you can now you can kind of visualize those uh, um, pigs that are used for truffle hunting. You know, the pigs have a pretty good sense of smell. Um, it's about 1030. Now. It's about 1030. Wow. We're moving along. So let's see, what else are we going to look at with a skull? Um, how about, what are, what are these things? Uh, yeah. Not sure. The hole? Not the hole. I'm looking at these two knobby thingies right here. So you can tell there's an ear hole on the side. I'm not sure if you can see that very well. There's another one on the other side. So you got two ear holes and then you have these two like housing, I guess, areas for the ears. So this is called the auditory bully. So auditory and then bully is spelled B-U-L-L-A-E. <laughs> yeah. Bulblia. <laughs> Bulblia. I like that. There's a Bulblia. Um, so uh, one bully is called a bula, but um, both of them together are called the auditory bully. And this helps us get a sense for, you know, the sense of hearing for, of a skull. Um, these are relatively large for this animal. If you're looking at, say, Maybe we'll try, well shoot, you don't even, you barely have any on there. Do you have a, a good example here with bully? Oh <clears throat> man, we don't have very good ones. Hold up. Well, even the rabbit has a pretty good one. I wanna make sure I have a good example. Do you think the cow, oh, the cow has a, what? There's a cow. There's a cow? There's a cow here. That's not the bully though. Wool. Wool. What is that? So this is a cow. And you can actually kind of tell the there's the ear hole and the bully are not that big. Where is the other one? There's a lot of dirt in this one. I'm gonna get kind of dirty. This is actually Rick's, so awesome. I blame him. It's kind of dirty, but you can tell it has a it has really small, small ear cavities or auditory bully. Um, so that gives us one indication of hearing. But the other thing is, is like there are things outside the ears, the ear holes that help us hear. These things, right? You have your ear flaps. Um, so what we call our ears are like these, these cartilaginous outer pieces. And they help us hear somewhat, but if you ever cup your hands around your ears like this, you can hear so much better. My mask kind of pushes my ears forward. 
<laughs> that could be a benefit. That could be a benefit. Yep. Could be a benefit. So, you know, you can use that to hear better. Now, a lot of animals have already built in ear flaps. They have already built in ones. <laughs> Are you listening behind you, Rick? Uh, yep. <laughs> Just like a horse. So you or can a fox. Yeah. So you can you can actually think of like with with the rabbit. The rabbit has really good hearing. So this is about relatively the same size as that, um, that as a bobcat, for instance. Maybe it's slightly smaller, the the cavities. But you when you think about a rabbit, like they have a big long ear that sticks up, and it helps them hear so much better. Um, same thing with the deer skull. So we don't have an auditory bully. Or, oh, I guess that's it. Maybe. That's really small. But in any case, like if you've ever seen a black-tailed deer, you know they have the big long ears that stick up out of their head and allow them to hear a little bit better. The nice thing about those ear flaps, too, is that at least other animals can wiggle them. We can't really wiggle our ears in different directions to help us hear in different directions. So, awesome. I wanted to kind of quiz you guys a little bit based on what you, based on what you've learned. So, Rick, what do you think we should test them with? <clears throat> well, there are a few things we have. Oh, for the skulls? Yeah, for the skulls. Well, we could uh, share one of my, uh, okay. well, okay, we could... Um, you want to try that one? Yeah, I was going to talk so, about this. Okay. This is really cool. So, uh, these are the, uh, what do they call them? Intercranial uh, sutures. Sutures. <laughs> They're called the zigzag interfrontal suture, or you just call them sutures, but each one. Each deer has a unique pattern, and it looks like a meandering stream. So it's a really cool to see this, and you can see it in other parts. Normal, like uh, humans, they they uh, don't have this these uh, this meandering suture, but you can see it up through here as well. We we still have sutures, but we don't necessarily have like sutures that meander like right. this Meandering yeah sutures. Yep. they don't look so so pretty ours are are very utilitarian looking right. <laughs> so anyways this is a, one of my fascinating uh tidbits on the skull where are those holes in the front that's not their eyeballs is it no that's a that's a um intra intra orbital uh oh gosh I'm losing, I'm losing my vocabulary. Uh, intro, it, there's, there's, a, there's a vein that goes in there, and I can't remember what it's called. Um, but that allows for that, for that vein to, oh, okay. to go through well, the skull. Is, yeah. is that to feed the uh, velvet on the antlers? Or? Um, that might, I'm or not sure. I, I think, I think the these thing. actually feed the velvet through the antlers. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure. So don't quote me on it, but I'm, I, I got to look that up. Got to look that one up. Even I have to look things up, even after studying it for so long. Yeah. I'm, yeah, so why don't we show them that? So does anybody know where that, what that might have come from? Deer. That's a... Emma says deer. Yeah. What part of the deer did it come from? Nom 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 nom. nom. Herbivore, Carol says. Yep, it's, it is it is an herbivore. And this jaw. is it is a jaw, there yes. It's the lower jaw. So you can tell like um, this is uh, what connects up into the um, up into the skull, 
And what I like to point out with herbivores is we have all of these different plates, um, plates for, for grinding up plant material. So this is a lot different than your carnivores. They have more scissoring action. They have these all, all these little plates in here for surface area so they can just grind and grind and grind and grind and grind. That's why you see a cow, they're like chewing and chewing and chewing and then they swallow it and then they spit it back up again and then they chew it some more. Um, that's what it's called, chewing their cud. Um, they also have this um, empty area and it's called the diastema, I think. Um, and this allows uh, for them to just kind of like hold food while they're chewing. Um, and then normally you would have uh, more bone here where they're, they have their incisors. They have very util, most animals have pretty utilitarian incisors. They're just like, they come down and they're there to bite, bite, chomp, bite, chomp kind of thing. Oh, you want to show them that? Let's have them guess that one. Yeah, while well, you're talking about incisors. What is that? <laughs> Two thumbs up. It's a smaller animal. Somebody said, is it a lizard? Hmm, that is a good guess. But take a look at the teeth. Like, yeah, I like uh, show them, show them the the plate-like teeth here, and also those massive incisors. Someone wants to know if it's a rat. <sighs> getting closer. Getting closer. Getting closer. Did this pretend, or did you find this one, Rick? No, this one is one from our from our collections. It's from our collection, okay. Yeah. Mouse? Maybe it's a bit big. Bigger. That's, bigger. Yeah, think bigger Lord than a mouse. Rodent, Ron says. Is it a beaver? It's Maybe not a it's beaver. A if it's a beaver too? It's not a, well, so, okay. This is actually a jackrabbit. What? This is a jackrabbit. Um, so they, jackrabbits are not rodents, okay? Rabbits, bunnies, you know, anything with the big floppy ears like that, those are um, lagomorphs. They're called lagomorphs. Um, but they have very, very similar teeth. So we have an example here to kind of show that. Um, rodents like beavers and rats and shrews and mice and all those different kinds of animals, they have um, front incisors. They have two and two. And it's just used for, they use it for all kinds of things. They'll gnaw on bones, they'll gnaw on wood, they'll um, use it for uh, uh, basically crunching up plant material, and they you have those very specialized back teeth for, for grinding up that plant material. Now what is super fascinating about lagomorphs in particular, well actually, about rodents in particular, is that um, on your ungulates, like your deer and your cows, all of their teeth, they grow in and they stop growing after a certain point. They're like our teeth, okay? We get our permanent adult teeth and they're done. So you better go to the dentist, right? Um, for, for rabbits in particular, for rabbits and rodents, their front incisors are constantly growing. They have to gnaw on things, okay? So these front teeth of this guy, they're gonna keep, keep, keep growing. Um, Obviously not now, because he's dead, but, well, this is a bone clone, but still, um, they would keep, keep growing. Beaver, the same thing. You can always, almost always identify a beaver incisors because they're orange. They actually get a lot of iron um, from, from what they eat. So they, their teeth, their front teeth actually tend to be orange. Um, yeah, so like if you had a pet rabbit, like, we used to have. Uh, we had to make sure that they had adequate uh, foliage to chew on because we didn't want any problems with their teeth overgrowing. Mm -hmm. So they had to have non-poisonous wood and, and uh, you know dried 
uh, hay and stuff like that to chew on. Mm -hmm. But what's the really cool in particular about the uh, lagomorphs? This is actually another. Um, this is another uh, jackrabbit, and you can see it a lot better. <clears throat> this jackrabbit actually has two more incisors on the inside. So um, lagomorphs, they have extra incisors. Rodents don't have those two extra incisors on the inside there. So that's another way you can tell like the difference between like a rabbit, a lagomorph versus a rodent. Rodents that's don't have that. Rabbit's front teeth? Yep, look at those. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Super cool, huh? What? Yeah, and what's also interesting, if you're looking at uh, vegetation and you're wondering who ate the vegetation, you can tell if it's a rabbit that they, uh, it's got a really clean cut on the vegetation and it's typically like at a 45 degree angle. Whereas opposed to a deer, they uh, do not cut it like the rabbit. And so it's kind of more of a tear. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how you can tell who's feeding on the vegetation based on the teeth morphology. That's super cool. I'm going to use that detective work next time I work in my garden. Who ate my cabbages? <laughs> super cool. All right, so we got some more skeletal pieces here. Oh, why don't we show them, can we show them that skull in the back next to the, yeah, let's, let's show them that one. So guys, your favorite, favorite, favorite animal, one of my favorite animals at least. So, what do you guys think that this might be, based on what we've talked about? I don't think we can open the jaw on that one. Oh, no, that's like a this is <coughs> glued shut. Yeah. But we can still show you the carnassials on the side. This is an animal that would cause humans to even look over their shoulder when they're out hiking. <laughs> Any guesses? What do you guys think it is? Question mark? Wild cat? It's a wild cat, it of course. Cat. It is a wild cat. <laughs> think about the size comparison between... Lion? Yeah. So we have our little bob kitty here, and we have our mountain lion here. <laughs> bob kitty is probably slightly bigger than a house cat. Like if you had a house cat skull, it'd be slightly smaller, I think. So if you were to do a com size comparison, they are pretty much very specialized, very um, specific animals. You have the carnassial, you, you have the, the canines, obviously, the carnassials along the side. Very short snout. They're quite surprised. Uh, yeah, the very big eyes and front forward facing eyes. And relatively, is relatively small auditory bully. Oh, okay. Um, relatively small, but still forces to be reckoned with, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, very, very good guess. That is uh, definitely a mountain lion. I like to also to, to point out, you have a nice sagittal crest here. So um, you know, why don't you speak to that, Rick? I think you, you might know a little bit more about that. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, the sagittal crest is, uh, the larger the crest is typically the more uh, crushing power the, the, the jaws have. Um, because of the muscles that attach to the sagittal crest. So you get more muscle if the sagittal crest is higher. And also if it's more... Uh, rough? Rough, then the muscles can attach to the skull itself. Mm -hmm. And the name of this muscle is the 
It begins with a T. Oh my gosh. Oh, don't ask me about well, muscles. Anyway, it's a, it's a muscle. There's a couple muscles that are used, big muscles uh, for uh, biting and, and crushing. Somebody Google that really quick. And yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, your, tip, tip, your large carnivores have tremendous sagittal crests, like uh, wolves, wolverines. Mm -hmm. That bears are huge. Bears, oh. mm -hmm. polar bears. So yep. um, tremendous crushing power. I think even sea lions have quite a... Oh yeah. Quite a sagittal crest. Fun fact, I used to do a lot of um, skeletal uh, processing uh, for, for archaeological specimens and we went through a lot of seals and a lot of sea lions and yes, they have very massive sag sagittal crests. You do not want to get bit by a sea lion. It won't Ooh. let go. Whoa. So, you know, be careful when you're with wildlife, but yeah. It's very, 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 that's a pretty prominent one. Like as compared to the bobcat, I, what I'm noticing is like this has a lot more biting force. This cat basically has his little bit at the end, um, which tells hurt. me, yeah, it would still hurt. It would still hurt, but See? still. So you can tell uh, mm -hmm. that this one is a carnivore because of the, the need for biting power. Mm -hmm. And this one doesn't it, have any. There's no sagittal crest on here to speak of. Mm -hmm. And so this is the herbivore. Yep. Very cool. Let's take a look at. Ooh. So. What are we? How are we on time, Terry? Wow. Okay. We might be able to get to our special features in just a second. Um, I wanted to show you guys this one. So we didn't really talk about these too much, but I wanted to get a guess from you guys. Aha. I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Can people see that pretty well? Peek -peek. Awesome. Who's that? Who is that? We had a fan of these earlier. Now's your chance. Mm hmm <laughs> I'm rotating so it can get all all views. Just look at that hook, man. Prey bird. It is a bird of prey. That is a bird of prey. That is a good that is a good guess. Um there's a there's another hint here. We also have like these in case. No. Nocturnal, Mike said. It, it is nocturnal. It is uh, definitely. Yeah. How did you know that? Crow? Are crows. Like, I feel like crows just, just do their thing at all yeah, times of the it day. It is a vulture. It is I'm not. i the comments. Oh, uh, no. It is a vulture. Bird at least. It is definitely a bird, and it's definitely a bird of prey, and it's a nocturnal bird of prey. Mm -hmm. So when we think about birds of prey, um, we're often, we look at beaks. Because they, owl. owl, that is awesome. So yeah, birds don't have teeth. So we can't necessarily use dentition when we're talking about birds, but we can definitely look at beak shape to figure out like what, what it ate. Um, we don't have a whole lot of examples of birds, unfortunately. But um, we do have this guy. We have another one back there. Um, but next time you go to the pond or to the lake, de definitely t check out your, your ducks and your mallards because they also have very specialized beaks for what they're eating. Um, what I w did want to point out is that we have these, uh, oh, what are these called? These <laughs> eye rings. They have these like orbital, eye, like, orbital rings here. Um, and that actually helps hold the eyes in place. Um, owls can't move their eyes. They have to turn their head. And that is why they have such a flexible neck. They cannot turn it all the way around, but they can get pretty close. So uh, this allows this animal to see around. 
Um, it also, um, I wanted to mention, it also has really large eye sockets. Um, if we had, we had a, a hawk, a hawk actually has smaller eye sockets. Um, and they're not, they're not as super encased like that. So very cool. We did want to show you that. Also want to show you the full on, <laughs> it's not, it's not showing what it is, right? Oh, super cool. So you can kind of tell this is a seed eating kind of bird. Or it could be a seed eating or an insect eater. It seems like not super specialized in this case. I forget what those eye rings are called. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, there is a term for that for that eye ring. Ocular, ocular, ocular maybe. But um, <laughs> you can tell by the size of this bird, and also a few things about this bird to to figure out what kind of bird it is. So, um, birds that can fly have something on the bottom called a keel. So, um, a keel is a part of the breastplate of a bird. And it actually, this is where the muscles attach um, for flight. Okay, so they, this is like massive, right? Most of your birds that fly uh, they have really, really big keels because they need a good anchor point for, for pulling their wings down and doing this. They're guessing seagull, chicken, hen. These are good chicken, guys. hen, closer. Oh, really close. Think about, think smaller and think, um, urban. yeah, ur yeah, urban. Think urban. That's a, that's a strong hint there. Um, so that's, that's one way that you can tell your, you know, flightless versus, um, flightful birds. Hold on one second. Oh, oh yeah. We got to switch out some things. Yeah. So you're doing good. Just, just, uh, keep yep, talking loud. No worries. Um, Plug in. and for, for this guy as well, um, gosh, most of your birds also have fused bones. So any bones that you um, they may be fused together because they're trying to reduce the number of bones that they have and they also um, want to reduce the weight. So if you see a bone and it's super delicate and super lightweight, it's probably a bird bone. Um, they have pneumatic bones, which are bones filled with air, and that helps them um, with reducing their weight so that they can fly better. Pindu got it. He said pigeon. Aha! Yes, this is a pigeon. Let me swipe this from you. Oh. Just unclip. Just unclip here. Woohoo! Ta um, so hopefully you guys can still hear me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so this is a pigeon. Um, what what were you gonna point out? Oh uh, well, I was gonna talk. Uh, I looked up the name of the the ring for the uh, around the eye. What is it called? Uh, Sclerotic ring. Oh, a sclerotic. Yeah. Slurotic ring. Yeah. Good job. Slurotic See, we look ring. stuff up too. Yeah. We totally do. And one of my favorite bones on a bird, um, and it's one that you will find every Thanksgiving, is this one right here. That is called, um, in our terms, it's called the wishbone, right? You take that bone out of the turkey and then you pull it and then uh, whoever has the longest piece, uh, their wish comes true. Um, but the scientific name for it is furcula. Furcula? Furcula. And <laughs> That's a Jeopardy question. <laughs> you can tell birds are really weird because the furcula is actually two, your two uh, clavicles fused together. Isn't that kind of weird or what? So, anyway. It's really interesting. Okay, so the... So go ahead, if you feel comfortable taking your mask off with a lower volume, they're having a little trouble hearing, but we are okay. at one minute. Awesome. I'm okay. going to go mobile here. All right. And We're going to go you closer. We're going to come over here because we have one last treat for you guys. Um, I'm going to put Pidgey back in his, Pidgey. Bag in, back in his case. 
Um, so we have something, a little bit of a treat for you guys at the very end of this. Um, can you, can they hear me any better? Yeah, or I think so. I'll be, I'll be really close to you now. Okay. I have my mask on, so, yeah. Well, I, I have my mask on too, because I want to be safe too. Extra careful. Extra careful. So, rah. I'm wearing gloves. It is a good idea whenever you unpack something like this, whenever you pick up any kind of bones, to kind of wear gloves. We know where these have been, because... These are ours, but whenever you go out into the wild, wear gloves. Um, so anyway, let's see what Terry has got for me. Ew! Does anybody know what that is? It's not a poop, is it? I don't think so. It's not edible. It's not edible. Wonder, ooh, but it breaks open. Oh, <gasps> whoa. So one other cool fact about owls is that um, they, they don't digest most of the hard parts in a, uh, in a uh, skeleton. And they'll often eat their prey mostly whole or ripped and teared, teared in pieces. So in any case, they regurgitate all of those hard pieces back up into a package. You can see this is a whole bunch of fur in here. And we also have a few bones in here. So if you're ever looking for bones and you're like, oh, I wonder, wonder what, where I can find some good bones, definitely check your local owl roost. You'll find owl pellets. So here's a little tiny vertebra from a little, little, little tiny rodent. Probably a shrew. It could be a bat or it could be a mouse. Rick is looking, well, looking you, at his book. If you can find a jawbone, I can help identify what this owl ate. Yeah, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna do, we're gonna look for a jawbone. So if, <clears throat> based on the size of the pellet, Whoa. Okay, what 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 do you uh, think this owl, what kind of owl oh, I don't regurgitated this pellet based on the size? <gasps> I found a jawbone. What? Here's a jawbone. Here we go. Okay. Well, let's see if we can uh, <laughs> check it out here. No. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, that looks kind of like that one. So these are all life-size uh, So you drawings. need something bigger. Could even be bigger. Yeah, this could be bigger. So this book has life-size pictures of them? Yes. yes. Oh my gosh, that's so, you, so cool. So you just overlay it. Yeah. Oh man, that has more like these teeth. Yeah, you should, wait. Just, you should just be able to overlay it right on top and see how... <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Woo! Montane vole. Very cool. Well, it could also be this. Could also be a meadow vole. Whoa. Well, it's definitely a vole. Yep. Yeah. Cool. That is so very cool, guys. You see that? This is an awesome book. This is a very cool book. I've got to get a copy of this book. I can't believe I don't have a copy <laughs> of this book. That's so cool. Look at that. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Wow. Neat. So, so it's time, a, time to wrap up. Out. Well, yeah, we'll wrap her up in a second. I kind of want to pick up this owl pellet some more. Um, I'm a terrible person. But we can, we can do it. We can go live again. Awesome. Um, right after this. We'll just end this one. I'll switch my phone so we have a new battery. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can plug good. your mic back in and you can dissect the next one. All right. Well, we're so. going to go ahead and wrap up and then... Uh, We'll maybe play around with the, the owl pellets some more. But um, hopefully you guys got to learn a little bit. Let us know in the comments if you have any particular questions and we will try our best to answer some of them. What is that book called? That book. Animal Skulls. Yeah, it's called Animal Skulls, A Guide to North American Species. So cool. So that's a really good reference. I think you can probably find that in the local library. And if, mm -hmm. if not, definitely worth purchasing. Um, 
Neat. I wanted to thank you all for coming out and, and being with us today. And this is a this is kind of a, a special topic for me. I really enjoy looking at bones and stuff. Um, hopefully you guys got to learn a little bit while you were here. I wanted to thank Rick for coming out and being with us. Um, he's He's a local specialist and definitely an enthusiast, and we're really lucky to have him as a volunteer. Um, but yeah, what is tomorrow's show, Terry? Tomorrow's all about cats. Cats, cats, cats. Cats? Meow. Like me? Even not quite as special. Not quite as special. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty cool cat. She's all a pretty right. cool cat. Awesome. Well, thank you again, guys. Thank you, everybody. And and if you want, I'm about to tune back in and we can dissect the, um, the owl pellet. But for this one, I'm going to go ahead and finish it. And I, I have a fresh phone with a fresh battery, so I'll be able to plug back in the sound. Awesome. Okay? Okay. Thank you. See you in a minute.